David, you're poet laureate for Wyoming. Uh, as I understand, being the poet laureate for Wyoming is a little bit different than most other states. Well, it's a big honor for me, and it's it's generally thought of as an honor honor title in most states. And in many places, the poet laureate doesn't actually have any job. I do have one job I quite like, and that is each year I go into the legislature, and I give a little talk about the place of culture in our communities and the kind of life we lead, the feel we have about our lives, you know, the sense of each other. And I try to talk to the legislators about why one might care about poetry in maybe ways that aren't particularly practical. The love of sounds, you know, the love of an image, something that you feel about something, your emotional life. You know, there's a joke that Renaissance noblemen, they all wrote sonnets. And re every Renaissance nobleman had to write a sonnet. But he only wrote it for one reason, that was to woo women. So there was a practical purpose in that thing, even though he was also doing all this high skill business. Now I think, nobody woos women by writing poems, do they? I, well, I'll think about that later. But I go in and I talk to the legislators. It's really exciting and I try to give them a sense of our shared chore in creating a society we want to live in. So that's part of it. And I'm going to read you something if you don't mind. Go ahead. Is that all right? Because when I was appointed poet laureate, it was, it was a surprise to me. I mean, I knew that my name had been put up as one that might be considered, but still surprising. I'm not a Wyoming native, you know. I've been here many years now, but I kind of felt like maybe I'm a little bit of an outsider and all. And actually being appointed makes me feel much more like it's my place, you know. So when I was appointed, I had a funny experience, and I wanted to write about that experience. The poem is called Talking with the Governor After the Johnson County Fair and Rodeo Parade. That's when the governor came and told me, I, I think I'm going to appoint you Poet Laureate. So here's the poem. And it's based on classical Chinese business, if anybody cares. I've been appointed Poet Laureate of my state. Granted, it's the least populated state in the Union, and one which many Americans can't place on a map. Still, I could receive no greater honor. But I offer few thanks and seem, I'm afraid, not quite present. The fact is, I've been babysitting a friend's dog while she's away in Denver getting some culture. Someone has opened the gate of my yard during the parade, and the dog, a long-haired dachshund named Abby, whose ears fly like wings when she runs, has disappeared. I imagine the screaming and the sounds of gunshots, even though blanks, the roar of motorcycles and diesel generators, and the whining of the go-karts driven by middle-aged men in red fezes have combined to terrify the dog. She's gone, and my friend is going to kill me. Poet laureate, be damned. So I don't properly thank the governor and disappear into the crowds asking people if they've seen the little dog. A few hours later, a policeman comes by to tell me he saw a little dog lying in the middle of the parade route on her back as if sunbathing before the horses arrived to crush her. He picked her up and he put her in his house and now he's brought her to me to see if she's the one. Yes! I shout in joy, but it's too late to thank the governor who's already gone. Well, poetry. They say that poetry is more often than not against the ideals of normal social life. And so the governor takes a risk, not in naming me poet laureate, but in naming anyone to such a post. The risk isn't for what a person might do or say, but for poetry, what it is and might be. So that was kind of how I was feeling about it. I don't know if that makes sense to you, but you know, I wanted to get the real life business in with the elevated business. What inspires you? You know, it's very interesting. Today I wrote a poem, and it was the funniest kind of deal of writing it. I've been thinking about it a lot because I'm teaching this term. I teach one semester each year at the University of Wyoming. The rest of the year I'm kind of a freelance artist. But I teach in the fall, and um, I'm trying to talk to my students about what it means to write something. How do you write? Where does it come from? All that kind of business. And I realized that I suddenly was thinking about the big squabble over what we're going to do in Iraq. You know, are we leaving Iraq? Are we staying in Iraq for the rest of our lives? Are we going to have Iraq phone numbers in our cell phones for the next 45 years, that business? But I didn't plan to write anything about it. And suddenly, it came into my mind lying on a lawn watching people play soccer. And as I started thinking about people having fun, enjoying themselves, weather, fields, games, all of that, slowly the whole poem shifted around to the fact that in my lifetime, I was born in the summer of 1950. I was born actually the day after or before, I can't remember, the U.S. war began in Korea. And the United States was already at war in Vietnam, kind of in a slow burn way. You know, the French were officially in charge. 
But for the first 25 years of my life, we were at war with Viet or in Vietnam. I'm not sure who we were at war with, but mm -hmm. we were in Vietnam. And now we have this other kind of perpetual war. Well, the whole poem kind of shifted around to that. You know what I mean? And I, I wrote it in three minutes, as fast as I could, and I didn't have any paper or pencil. So there was a trash can near where I was standing, and I grabbed an eight and a half by 11 envelope out of it and stole a pencil off somebody's desk and wrote the thing as fast as I could. But I think the way that works is because you spend your whole life practicing. You know how athletes talk about this. If you go in a basketball court and you shoot 10,000 free throws, you're liable to do better in the game. Mm -hmm. And I felt that way about writing the poem. That's not a muse, but that's a practice. So. Yeah. Um, so are, are we talking uh, the, the old phrase, 90% perspiration, 10% inspiration? Yeah, maybe. Or? I don't know. But I don't know if you can separate perspiration and inspiration. They both have purr in them somehow. <laughs> and there is a great saying in Mexican Spanish about what it takes to be a writer. And the saying is, nalgas y un lapis, which means the seat of your pants and a pencil. So it's what you're saying that old story about perspiration. If you're willing to sit there and put in the time and work at it, something's going to show up eventually, we believe. Uh, given to others, would you be doing poetry or would you be doing essays and prose? Or? Oh, you know what? I don't separate these things. They're just, to me, and maybe that's an issue, because my work, there are people who really love my work. I know that in the American literary community, but there are people who don't like it, too. And one of the criticisms of my work as a poet is that it's too prose-like. And one of the criticisms of my essays is that they're, they're too poetic. Uh, in both cases, there's a kind of attention to language without the requisite attention to metrical rhythmic issues that sometimes people imagine should be in poems. In other words, people just say, well, why are these poems? Why don't you just call them prose? They feel like stories to me, little tiny stories. And I sometimes think, well, maybe a poem is a compressed story. At least one kind of poem is a compressed story. Well, that kind of brings me to a, a strange little phrase you wrote, something about, because we have a book called Windmills here, and yeah. one of the phrases that I pulled out of it was something that was very intriguing to me. It was, uh, win, uh, windmills are not so much uh, a water retrieval system as a religious artifact. Yeah. <laughs> well, they do sort of stand up in their air <laughs> like that, and they have that thing that's sort of cross-like, isn't it? But I didn't actually mean that. I actually meant there is a kind of spiritual quality to becoming... Um, not exactly one with the land, but a participant in the processes of the land. Like, I spent, this book, Windmill, that you mentioned, I spent about 10 years working with my father-in-law, who's a Johnson County rancher, Basque rancher, and much of what I know and understand about Wyoming life comes through marrying into a Wyoming Basque family. That's been a very powerful thing for me. And to work with my father-in-law on his ranch, which is tough, broken, you know, it's that kind of cruddy, dry, riveted chunk land between Buffalo and Powder River. Um, Powder River is the east boundary of his ranch. And basically my job was maintaining, restoring, fixing in any way windmills. And all the work I did on that, I just came to feel more and more a little piece of that landscape. And that's the spirituality that I felt. But the land was very much for me became a living force that uh, encompassed me. Uh, well, it's been a far flung and fun interview, David Good, Romvet. Poet Laureate for Wyoming. Thanks. I hope you come back and join us and thank you. maybe just spend that. some time talking about music. That'd be great. Terrific. Thanks. Thank you.